Hi guys, in this video we're going to revise rates of reaction using past paper questions. The link to these questions can be found in the description down below and this video is suitable for second year A-level chemistry students. Reaction is first order with respect to a reactant. Which rate concentration graph for reactant X is the correct shape? So rate concentration graph, we have rate on the y-axis and concentration on the x-axis and first order concentration is directly proportional to rate so that line will go through the origin zero zero so the correct answer is a next question a reaction is zero order with respect to a reactant which concentration time graph for reactant a is the correct shape so concentration time zero order it's a straight line with a negative gradient we have concentration on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. The gradient of the line gives us the rate. And that rate there, because it's a straight line, is constant. So it's unaffected by changing concentration. The next question is about the Arrhenius equation. And it says a graph is plotted of ln k, that's natural log of the rate constant, against 1 over t where T is temperature. The gradient has a value of minus 55,000 and it's asking us what the activation energy is in kilojoules per mole. So in an Arrhenius plot, the gradient is equal to the activation energy over the gas constant. To get the activation energy by itself, we need to times it by the gas constant. So we're going to times minus 55,000 by the gas constant, which we can find in our data sheet. At the moment, this is in joules per mole, activation energy. So then we just divide by a thousand and we get our answer in kilojoules per mole, 457. Correct answer is D. This next question isn't part of rates, but since it's here, we'll go over it quickly. It's an equilibrium question, it's Kp. So that's the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure which applies to reactions where we have gases. And Kp is very similar to Kc. We do the concentrations, or in this case, the partial pressures of the products raised to the power of the number of moles divided by the partial pressures of the reactants times together raised to the power of the number of moles. And it gives us two partial pressures, one of nitrogen, one of hydrogen. We need to work out the partial pressure of ammonia so we can add up the partial pressures of these two gases, take that away from the total pressure and that will give us the partial pressure of ammonia. And then we just plug in those partial pressures into the Kp expression and we end up with 0 0.048. This next one we have an initial rates table. And it's asking us to find the rate equation and the rate constant and its units. So in this table, we're looking for, we want to find the orders with respect to these three reactants. And to do that, we're going to take them one by one. If we want to find the order with respect to hydrogen peroxide, that means we have to find two experiments out of these four where the concentrations of iodide and H plus ions remain constant. So that will be experiments one and three. So iodide concentrations constant at 0 0.01 and H plus ions, the concentration of those are constant at 0 0.1. And then we can look at what's happening to the peroxide, it's doubling. And whatever the peroxide is doing, that is what is affecting the rate because the other two are constant and we see the rate doubles as well. So that means the order with respect to peroxide is first order. Then we do the same for the iodide ions. So we want two experiments where the concentrations of everything else are constant. That's experiments one and two. Hydrogen peroxide remains constant at 0 0.01. H plus remains constant at 0 0.1 concentration of iodide doubles and the rate doubles as well. So it's also first order with respect to iodide. And then we do the same with the H plus ions. If we look at experiments three and four, concentration of hydrogen peroxide is constant. 
concentration of iodide is constant. Concentration of H plus doubles, but the rate remains constant. So changing concentration of H plus has no effect on the rate. That means it's zero order with respect to H plus. Now we can write a rate equation based on this that we've just worked out. So rate equals little k, lower k, that is the rate constant, times by concentrations of iodide and H2O2. These are first order, so we include them in the rate equation. We don't need to show the one, and anything that's zero order, we don't need to include that. Now we can rearrange for k, and we can calculate a value for the rate constant using the values from any one of these four experiments. I chose experiment three. So k is equal to rate, which is four times 10 to the minus six, divided by concentration of iodide, 0 0.01, times concentration of hydrogen peroxide, 0 0.02. And we come out with 0 0.02 for the rate constant. And to get the units, we plug those into the same rates expression. So we have units of rate, which are moles per decimeter cube per second, divided by units of concentration times together. Moles per decimeter cubed from the rate cancels with one of the moles per decimeter cubes of the concentrations on the bottom. And we're left with seconds to the minus one over moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom. The last step is to raise those units on the bottom to the top. And when we change sides, we change signs. So at the moment it's moles plus one on the bottom. We move it to the top, it becomes moles minus one. Decimeter minus three becomes decimeters plus three. And we've still got the seconds minus one, which was on the top. The rate constant is determined at different temperatures. Explain how the student could find the activation energy for the reaction graphically using values of K and T. So to do this, you can plot an Arrhenius graph of ln K, so natural log of the rate constant versus one over temperature. Then you can find the gradient, which will be equal to the activation energy over the gas constant. And that minus is there because that gradient is a downward slope. And then lastly, we can get activation energy by timesing our gradient by the gas constant. This question, we have a reaction between pentene and iodine, and it says, why can the order with respect to pent1ene be assumed to be zero in this investigation? And we don't really have any information about it. So when we're asked a question like that, it's nearly always because that substance is in excess. Anything that's in excess doesn't really affect the rate of reaction. And something that doesn't affect the rate of reaction sounds like zero order. Part B is part of the same question. The student's procedure shows the reaction is first order with respect to iodine. Show this is true and find the initial rate of reaction and rate constant. Show you're working on the graph. So the first step, we're going to find initial rate. Now to do that, you want to line your ruler up with those first two points on that graph and draw your tangent there. Then we can work out the gradient of that tangent and that will be equal to the initial rate. And I'll include a link to the mark scheme below so you can see what the gradient range is and what kind of answer it wants in order to get top marks. This is a leveled marking question. So you have three different bands. You can have five to six marks, um, three to four marks, or two and below. Next, we'll look at the order of iodine. So if we're given a concentration time graph and we suspect that it's first order, we can prove this by working out half-lives. So if we use this concentration at the top, 0 0.02, and we halve it to 0 0.01, we do a line straight across from this value, touch the curve and go down. And we write down what that time is in seconds. Halve the concentration again, do a line across, touch the curve and go down. 
and write down the time again. Working out the difference. So here we have a half-life of 2,500 seconds. We have it again, do the same, line straight across, touch the curve, go down. And we've got a constant half-life of 2,500 seconds, which indicates it is first order with respect to iodine. Lastly, it's wanting us to determine the rate constant, a value for the rate constant. And to do this, we can do natural log of 2 over t a half, where t a half is a half-life. So natural log of 2 over 2,500 seconds, and we get a value for k. Further experiments provide evidence that the reaction is first order with respect to both pentene and iodine. Write equations to suggest a two-step mechanism for this reaction. So we're going to derive a rate equation using this data. So rate equals k. Both of these are first order. So the rate equation will be this. That raised to the power 1, but we don't need to show that 1. And anything that's in the rate equation will appear on the reactant side in the slow step. And the order tells us the number of molecules. So since these are first order, we have one lot, one molecule of each in the slow step. And both these steps together must add up to equal the overall equation, which is over here. So we need this product at the end of the reaction. And that means that the products of the first reaction must be an intermediate or two intermediates, something that's produced in one step and used up in a following step. Because the overall reaction is just these things, these reactants in the slow step, producing the product. So these things, the intermediates need to cancel out. So we're just left with this. Suggesting two-step mechanisms is sometimes just a bit of trial and error. There are certain rules, like we've just discussed. Whatever appears in the rate equation is on the reactant side in the slow step. The orders tell you the number of molecules. The both, both of the steps must add to give the overall equations. We come up with something that makes sense and fits with that. So this makes sense for a fast step because these two things are charged. So these will react really fast, stick together and form the product. Suggest how the investigation could be modified to show the reaction is first order with respect to pentene. So we could just repeat that experiment keeping the concentration of iodine constant and measure the concentration of the pentene over time. This next question we have an initial rates table and then it's wanting a mechanism from us as well. So we'll start here and work out the orders of these. So comparing experiments one and two, the concentration of iodide ions remain constant. The concentration of iron, Fe3 plus ions, doubles, and the rate also doubles. That suggests the reaction is first order with respect to iron 3 plus ions. Then to work out the order with respect to iodide, we compare experiments one and three where the concentration of iron 3 plus is constant and the concentration of iodide ions doubles. If we look at the rate, the rate has increased by a factor of 4. So to work that out, we just do this number over this number and we come out with 4. So the rate has quadrupled. So that means the order with respect to iodide ions is second order. Therefore, our rate equation looks like this. Rate equals K. Fe3 plus times iodide ions squared. So that squared is for the second order with respect to the iodide. Next, we rearrange in terms of K using the values for any one of these three experiments. And we get a rate constant. It doesn't matter which experiment you use. As long as you stick to the same row, you'll get the same value for the rate constant. To get the units, plug those into the same rate expression. Units of rate are moles per decimeter cubed per second. Units of concentration, moles per decimeter cubed. Cancel what's the same on top and bottom. Whatever's left on the bottom, move it to the top. Remembering to times these, so it becomes moles squared 
dm minus 6, move it to the top, and it becomes moles minus 2, dm plus 6, and we've got this seconds minus 1 as well. So to suggest this mechanism, we look at our rate equation. We have one of the iron ions in our slow step, two iodide ions, and these react together to produce an intermediate. We work out what the intermediate is last. That's the last thing we do. If we then look at our overall equation, we can see we have two Fe3 plus on the reactant side. But our rate equation only has one Fe3 plus. That means we need to put another Fe3 plus in the next step, in the fast step. That's going to react with an intermediate. We'll leave that for now. We do that last to produce the products. So these products are unlikely to form from this first step, the slow step. So we'll write those in the fast step and then we just look at what we have and come up with a sensible looking intermediate that fits with what elements and the number of each thing that we have here. And I'll attach the link to the mark scheme below so you can see the other possible correct answers. In the next question, we're given some data. It's an Arrhenius plot, and it's asking us to draw a straight best fit line and calculate activation energy to three significant figures. And then it's asking us for the pre-exponential factor, which is a y-intercept when the x-axis starts at zero, which it does. So firstly, activation energy. We're going to do a straight line of best fit with our ruler that goes through most of the points. And to get activation energy, we work out the gradient of this line. I got 807. The mark scheme is in the description so you can see what the accepted range is. Times our gradient by the gas constant to come out with an activation energy. And this comes out in joules per mole. Then to get our y-intercept, which is the pre-exponential factor, we extrapolate or extend our line so it goes back to cross the y-axis. Look at the number, so 31.123, I get 31.3. The mark scheme said 31.4, so that suggests the line of best fit is a bit more that way, a little bit steeper. But if it's a bit steeper, ah, it will go through those three points instead. So for my y-intercept, I got 31.3. You do the inverse of the natural log, which is the exponential, and it's linked to number of collisions, frequency of collisions. So it's going to be a big number, 3.92 times 10 to the power 13. This next question is asking us to find the total volume of oxygen measured at room temperature and pressure. So we have a gas, it's room temperature and pressure. That's that equation, volume equals moles times 24 decimeters cubed. And we have a volume and a concentration of hydrogen peroxide here and a balanced equation. And we need to use the ratios here. So first step, is to work out moles of hydrogen peroxide doing concentration times volume and we get 0 0.0575. Second step, we're going to use that balanced equation. It's a 2 to 1 ratio of peroxide to oxygen. So to get the moles of oxygen, we halve the moles of hydrogen peroxide and we get 0 0.0288. And then finally, we can get volume of oxygen and to get that in centimetres cubed, we do moles times 24,000. If you wanted that in decimeters cubed, it would be moles times 24. And it's asking us for a piece of apparatus that would allow this gas volume, 690 centimeters cubed, to be collected. So a measuring cylinder would allow that, and we need a size as well, 1,000 centimeters cubed. Part B says suggest a different method that would allow the rate of reaction to be followed over time. So we could do the reaction in, for example, a conical flask and have that conical flask on a mass balance and we could measure 
mass loss as gas is released. Part C says find the initial rate of reaction, the order and the rate constant. For the initial rate, we're going to line our ruler up with those first three points again, draw a tangent there and work out the gradient. And we should come out with something similar to 1.58 times 10 to the minus 3. I've attached the mark scheme below so you can see how to get 6 out of 6 for this question and the range that's allowed. Then it wants the order with respect to hydrogen peroxide. It's a concentration time graph, so we can work out half-lives. If the half-lives are virtually constant, that suggests it's first order, which they are. So I got around 880-ish, 880 seconds for each half-life. So I did my first one at 2, touch the curve, go down. Next one at 1, touch the curve, go down. One half-life was 880. Half again around 880, half again, around 880 again. There's another way we could prove from the graph that it's first order with respect to hydrogen peroxide. So if we find the rate at any concentration, for example, the first gradient that we've done for initial rate, that is at concentration 2.3. We've got the rate for that already. If we halve that concentration, 1.15, that's here. We do a tangent there, compare those rates, the rate should be double at double the concentration. So whatever happens to the concentration happens to the rate. If we double the concentration, the rate doubles. If we halve the concentration, the rate halves. And I've shown that work in here. So you can see the tangents drawn on the graph and the half-lives. The tangents are in purple, the half-lives are in green. Obviously for the exam, you'll be using a pencil and a black pen. And then to calculate K, there's two different ways we can do this. Rate over concentration or natural log of two over the half-life. And we should get a similar answer for each either way that you do it.